he said, man, it's cold today. I said, I think winter's here. And he said, false winter. He said, don't worry, it's just a false <laughs> winter. So, so I hope he's right. We're gonna I have hope he's right. Too, Indian summer it coming right around the cold. corner. Um, and everybody survived Halloween. Did you have trick-or-treaters? I did not, not one. I waited out there. I had hundreds of pounds of candy. Did you, sat there. did you even turn your lights on? Oh, you're supposed to do that? You're one of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we went down to Spencer and had uh, Halloween with the little grand I girls. That was fun. And I tell you what, those, there's some pretty crafty costumes there out there. There are, um, there are. There's enough fans in some of those inflatables to uh, <laughs> kind of run a, a drone. I mean, they were, there were some really crafty, crafty things. Those little Chinese people make some <laughs> they really, make some neat costumes. really neat costumes. I mean, we saw um, dinosaurs and unicorns yep. and whatever happens to be in um, this year. There's people that once you look at them, you think, oh my gosh, you know, you didn't know what it was until you got close. There's yep. some yep. fun stuff. So um, everybody's headed for the diabetes checkup <laughs> probably yeah. now after the candy. Yeah. Um, I yeah. told uh, I told Mark's kids the more candy you eat, the smarter you get in school. So my wife said, oh, when I'm sure the teachers appreciate <laughs> My that. wife said when she taught school that was the worst day of the year yeah. was the day after yeah. Halloween. Anyway, we survived, survived Halloween. And uh, if you tuned in last week, we had unsung heroes and a lot of different really things that we can't live without. Um, we had Ray Murphy's uh, bottom feeder and oh, yeah. different products of his and um, all kinds of different things, which we use on a daily basis. And I know a lot of people, especially the beginners, they look through the catalog or they look at a line and they're, they're considering something, but they've not seen it in person and they don't know if, you know, the hype is really, you know, worth, worth the money and things like that. But there's a lot of those type of things which um, we just couldn't operate our shop without. Absolutely not. There, there are just things you use every day and we don't even think to bring them up here in front of people, but they, they may not be glamorous and glitzy, but yep. sharpening steel for instance. I was, I was looking at that when <laughs> oh, I was talking. No, oh. and I, go ahead, that's, tell them about that. No, that's something uh, we could I was saying, just, just something like that. We, yeah. we can't function. We can't skin a rabbit without our sharpening yep. steels and yep. things like that. So I hope that was helpful to you. Um, go back and look at some of those things. There's, and I'm sure you have a lot of your own. Um, you can make a lot of the tools for the taxidermy yep. shop, and, or you can buy them. And there's just a lot of things which make your life easier. So today we're going to talk about um, kind of like opening day refresher. Um, we have a lot of, lot of people tuning in and we have um, people getting in deer. And some people are well versed. They've done this for 20, 30 years. And some people are beginners. And uh, whether, whether you're a beginner and can learn something from what we're telling you or um, you've done this for a long, long time, and we can give you one tip, you know, that might might help you out. I, that's good. So hope you learned something. And if you have ideas or different ways of doing things, um, make sure that you text in, and we'll uh, pass them along to everybody else because um, we do things our way. We're always open to new methods, but our way is not the only way, and, and you may, you know, show us something that, will surprise us and we may yeah. start doing it that way. So, so yeah. uh, make sure you let us know. And also as far as uh, the giveaway today, um, in the past we've been one week delayed, is that right Kate? Yes. And so you wanna like and share, like and share, and we always delayed it a week so the person who gets the um, gift this time would have been from last week, but we've right. changed that. Um, it's like and share, and it's going to be live during our broadcast. Did yes, I say that right? That's correct. Like, share, and tag two friends in the comments. And also make sure um, if your Facebook account is set to friends only that you either A, um, make this post public, or B, write shared in the comments as well so we can know that you uh, went ahead and did that. That sounds technical that for me. Sounds, yeah, there's a lot there. I'm sure you all know what she was talking about. Yeah. Um, last week, our winner was John Bellucci. 
Yes. It and is. Uh, he's one of our faithful followers, yes, and, he and uh, he's been in the taxidermy business a long time. Um, and when they say that uh, you forgot more than, more than most people know, um, some of us old timers, that's kind of the way it goes. And yeah. some of you people that have done a long time, like John and, and I, can relate to that comment, you know. Yeah. Um, but thanks a lot, John. He's always a good supporter. Uh, we want to talk about, I think we'll start at the very beginning, and we get a phone call, and somebody says, I shot a big deer, what do I do? First thing you're going to get is a phone call that says, how much do you get for deer? That's the <laughs> That's most the, common yep. phone call you're going to get. How much do you get for a deer? And that person is nothing more than kicking tires. He's calling every taxidermist that he can up and down the street, and... Mm -hmm. You're going to tell him what you get. He's going to call another guy, another guy, another guy. He's going to say, man, I can't afford that guy. That guy sounds too cheap. I'm going to take it to this guy. And he did everything through the phone. Um, we've yeah. encountered this for 40 years doing this. And uh, the object is you're going to want that person in your shop so that you can show him your work. If your work is as good as you feel it is and can be, and you can show him um, all the extras that you do, the, um, you know, the septum, the nicotine membrane, the tan skin, you know, there's, there's 50 different selling points in a white-tailed deer. And uh, if you can show him that and then let him go shop, let him go look at other taxidermy, um, taxidermist work. And chances are, if your work is good and your product will sell itself and he's gonna come back. Um, I always marvel at some of the younger people this day and age who spend a thousand dollars at the drop of a hat, whether it's oh gosh, whether yes. it's for a stereo system or a video coat game. or yeah. sunglasses or Air whatever shoes. it happens to be, yeah. or you know, um, there's a lot of people that don't have any qualms about spending money and spend it's the kind of kind of the younger people who sometimes don't know the value of a dollar yet <laughs> um, but uh, that's always when you start looking at some of the things people are spending money on and all the work that you put into this don't be afraid yeah. to charge a fair price for yeah. what you're doing don't undercut the value of your work anyway so the object is is to get the person into your shop so I've always been reluctant to say bring it in and I can show you, so I'll say, why don't you just stop by if you're in the area and look at our work and let me show you what we do. You know, And I don't have a problem telling them a price over the phone, but let me show you what we do for that kind of money. Um, they'll come in, you're gonna show them, um, show them the eyes, show them the, the expression you put in, show them the ear attitudes. Um, you know, they're going to have all kinds of concerns. I shot this deer, he really had a big neck. I want to make sure he has a big neck, you know. And, and uh, you know, you can reassure them on a lot of different areas. Show them a tanned hide. Um, that's something, especially with the ladies, uh, they're not quite sure what goes into, especially if they've not been exposed to it before, they're not really yeah. sure what goes into, you know, a quality mount. And so I tell... Uh, I, I'll ask a customer, where are you going to put it? Because it might make a difference if, if we do a wall pedestal like this or if we do a left turn, right turn, because if they hang it in a corner, it's not going to help them out. Yeah. It's not going to make your deer look good, and it's not going to make their trophy look good. You. Uh, Diana would like to know, what's the best way to advertise nowadays? Boy, oh. there's a lot of different ways. You go. Oh, man. Um, Advertising today, I think, is, I think it's very much social media oriented, um, depending upon who your followers are. There are some people out there that can advertise and reach thousands of people through social media, and there are other people who, even though they put up fantastic ads and so forth, don't have the followers and don't have the reach, um, so you really have to kind of know your know your niche there but I think the best advertising ever is is your customers from last year is word of mouth and let people do a good job and let your work advertise for itself um, I think you still have to 
beat the bushes and, and do the work for those of you that are just getting started in it. But think of every single piece that you do as a piece of advertising, every mount that you sure. do. Um, you want to be able to let your customer go home and show his buddies with flashlights inside the nose. And, and we've talked about these things before, nictitating membranes and inside the ears. And, and you can sell it very well, but if you educate your customers, they will sell it for you. And I think that even sells more. Um, what do you think? What would, um, where would you go? Well, I know this is going to surprise everybody, but when I started, there were no computers. There was, <laughs> there was no computers. Um, so Bill Gates like wasn't <laughs> born yet. Um, I would put an ad in the newspaper and I would have a picture of a flying pheasant and some weeds and stuff, and I'd say, you know, Matuska Taxidermy Studio in Oxford, whatever I put in there. Yeah. And I would get in, I mean, in those days, it was a $35 ad. I would get in a bird to mount, which I charged $35 for. Yeah. And I'd mount it to pay for that ad, and my ad ran every week and I would get about one bird, so it was kind of a wash. It was yeah. not, it was not things. Um, what you were saying, and we do that with our customers too, when we get them in the shop, and I like to have, I like to pick out a deer that we've done that, that I know looks good, and I'm not afraid if they touch it because they're not gonna find yeah. anything, you know? And I show them, I mean, you know, show them, um, first of all, Look how clean this is. This, this just couldn't be a cleaner looking deer. Now, they don't come that way when they come in. They're, yeah. they're kind of a mess, literally. Um, a lot of work went into this, not just the tanning, but the grooming, um, the beauty supplies we use and things like that. All of this hair was arranged extremely, extremely well, meticulously, um, probably prettier than he ever was in real life. But we show them that. I like to show them a tan hide. Feel that leather. Yeah. Smell that hair. I mean, yeah. it smells good. It's not, it's not like we started out working with. Um, I show them things like uh, look around the antler burrs. Make sure if you're shopping around, make sure that there's not, you know, bone, um, skull cap showing where somebody didn't fit something, didn't, didn't sew it good enough. I always like to have them look at the seam and feel the seam because if they go to another taxidermist and do that, chances are, I mean, we do a yeah. darn nice seam and chances are they're gonna feel something that will make them look at that and then they're gonna see stitches parted yeah. and a foam, form showing. Um, we like to show them the texture we put on the nose. I mean, every, and explain to them how you do it. Every single one of those little nodules is built up Re reconstructed. Um, we like to take a flashlight and shine a flashlight through one side and say, come over here and look. Um, we, have a, we have an artificial nose probably, but in there, I mean, you can have blood vessels in there. You can, you can have them really enhanced. The first thing they're gonna do when they get their deer done is they're gonna call Billy Bob next door and they're gonna say, come over and look at my deer. Does yours look like this? And they're gonna shine a flashlight in there. You know, it's, we have a lot of selling points that we kind of show them. Um, show them, show them the, the lip line. They don't, you know, how it's, mm -hmm. how it's kind of natural. You don't, it hasn't pulled apart. The hair is all laying where it's supposed to be. Um, we like to show them the hangers on the back because the hangers are also mm -hmm. special um, that we make sure we put on our deer. And just, you know, show them the different poses, show them all the different attitudes that we can do. Uh, we use a lot of nictitating membranes as something Hunters don't even know what a nictitating membrane is. <laughs> Many taxidermists don't put them in, and you don't need to, but if they come to my place first, I'm gonna tell them, and they're gonna go look at yours. Um, so um, show them all that. Then, don't be afraid to tell, you, tell them your price. Be proud of your price. Um, tell them what you get for a deer head. This is what we do. This is what we put into them. And now go shop. If we can be of help for you, help to you, mount your trophy, um, come on back and you know, we'll get it in our, in our queue. But uh, now that we did it to get the deer in and you said the best advertising is one that's just, that you just finished, 
when they pick up their deer, they, for, they forgot the sales pitch when you brought it in. They forgot all about that. Now show them again. Remember when you came in, we talked about all of this that we did. Remember the flashlight, show them, show them all that stuff again. Just a little refresher because now they're gonna take it home, hang it up, and they're gonna go, wow, those guys are really good. And that, then yeah. you, that is your best advertising. That's exceptional yeah. advertising. Yeah. It really is. And if, if you have time, maybe not this year, but if you have time, the object is to get them into your shop, maybe mount one of those deer, one of those deer you take a little extra time on and have it in the showroom so it's there when they come in, you're trying to get them in. Once they get there, you can, you can have that as a go-to piece sure, and show sure, them. Sure, sure. And, and let that be your advertising too. And there's a whole, I mean, you show them all the different uh, poses. I said that uh, the direction, left turn, right turn, step by sneak, you know, height of your ceiling, things like that. Um, coach them on what's gonna make the best looking mount. Yeah. And then I always ask people, like, where are you gonna hang it? And they'll say, well, I'll probably have to put it in my garage because my wife's not gonna let me put it in the house. I always say, is your wife, is your wife familiar with taxidermy, how it's done? No, nope, she doesn't care to. I just bring her by sometime. You know, I love, yeah, I love a woman that walks through the front door and goes, ew, ick, you know, bring them on. I'll show yeah. you. I'm gonna show her a styrofoam head. I'm gonna show them a styrofoam form like that. I'm gonna show them acrylic or glass eyes that have the white in them. I'm gonna show them an artificial nictitating membrane I like to take a wolf skin or something, a fox or, or a coyote that's tanned, really, really pretty hanging on the wall and, and let them feel it and smell it. And all of a sudden you will see them warming to the idea. Um, show them how you can create gaze and focus, like a little white here and a little white there just by your, you know, your artistic you know, yeah. um, ability and they're, they're not gonna believe that you do all that. You really do all that, yeah. And, yeah. and pretty soon, literally, that deer will be hanging in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah. We've done yeah. it a lot of times. Yeah. We do it yes. a lot. Yeah. Um, just bring me, it doesn't have to be a woman, but bring me somebody <laughs> in the front door that goes, ooh, ick, yeah. I'll wait in the car. Yeah. No, you're gonna come in here and I'm gonna show you stuff. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's it kind of, it it's really kind of fun. It really does work. <laughs> doesn't always work. Doesn't um, always work. You've had some students in the past that have done exceptional advertising too. Um, I think of who was the Utah student that went to, that had the flyer that went to all of the oh. different convenience stores. Pete Weimer. That sounds right. Yeah. Pete Weimer is probably listening. <laughs> um, Pete Weimer was from Utah, Monroe, Utah, I want to say, but I might be wrong. And and after he left school, he spent two days at the beginning of the week driving up the north side of the state, stopping at every bait shop, every sporting goods store that he could find. He gave them business cards. He gave them a little brochure, yeah. said, if there's ever anything I can do for you, you got any customers that you know need some, need some taxidermy work done, let me know, and then He'd spend another day in the southern half of the state and he had a route and he just did that over and over until he had a huge business, more yeah. than he could ever handle. But that, some people are very, very aggressive in that manner. Um, when we were teaching school in the business portion, uh, we always said some people that are really, really, really qualified taxidermists, like everything they do looks exceptionally professional and lifelike, but they're not, they don't have that type of personality and they will sit by the phone and wait for it to ring yeah. and it doesn't ring because nobody knows they're there. Somebody has to sing your praises and it's either gotta be you or it's gotta be, you know, somebody yeah. has to tell people you're out there. And now with social media, you know, you can do it without having that person, you know, shake his hand, yeah. things like that. Um, but, uh, people that sometimes don't do the best job and their work is a little less than what, what we like to see, yet they're very outgoing and very, um, you know, can walk up to any stranger on the street and say, 
shake their hand and say, hey, I'm a taxidermist. Come look what I, I can yeah. do. Those people ascend very more rapidly in their, in their careers than the really, really good person, and sad yeah. to say, but the really, really talented artist who sits at home and waits for the phone to ring because it, it yeah. tends to not. Um, yeah. You know, all the, we talked about all the sporting shows, um, um, Elk Foundation, um, FNAS, Foundation North American yeah. Wild Sheep, SCI, all those type of things. If you want to be really aggressive and, and help your business grow faster, um, set up a booth at those places, dress really nice, shake hands of all the people yeah. that could be your potential customers and you know, be yourself and don't be a phony guy. Yeah. And uh, those type of people do very well also, but it's not for everybody. Right, yeah, yeah, I think that's very, in a very small nutshell, I think we've kind of covered. <laughs> we've done it all, we've done everything. Yeah. And sometimes the advertising, sometimes you get more than you can handle and you don't, need to do as much advertising as as uh, some people spend an awful lot of time doing it and then end up with more work than they can turn out and bad press is some of the fastest spreading advertising ever so I always say tax me work is it way easier to get in than it is it, to get done yes very much so and not getting it done will bite you too so so let that be a good advertising tool. Use that good turnaround time and, and good reputation and good customer service to make people happy too. Okay, so let's say you, this guy brings you a deer, right? Um, got it in. Comes in the door and how do you handle that? Now it's here? <laughs> it's time to have deer. <laughs> no. Um, so now he's here. We went through telling him all of the things that he's going to see and do. Um, he's probably we've got all of his paperwork now. We've got to have a contract with him. We've got to agree on the price. Are you going to uh, thinking we want to touch on that too? Sure, sure, um, sure, sure. So and we prefer not to have the whole deer here, um, <laughs> but yeah. we do get that also. We have we have people drive up to the back door here mm -hmm. and and they've got a pickup with a big buck in the back. And what do I do with it? Can you cape it out for me? Yes, we'll cape it out for you. Um, ideally, I would rather get the head with all the cape attached, um, easier for us to handle. But uh, we do occasionally get the whole deer. If somebody calls and they say, we're skinning it now, how do you want me to do it? I, you know, a lot of people hang them up by the head and skin them out that way for taxidermy purposes. It's easy if you can hang him upside down, cut up the back of both hind legs, skin him all the way down to the front legs, cut up the back of both front legs and across the chest, and then just continue skinning down all the way, as far as you can get down the neck yep. to the antlers. Um, just keep turning him inside out, inside out. Sever the neck at the head or as far down as you can get. Um, bring that in. It's way easier. You don't have to haul a whole carcass around and and uh, it's easier for us to work with too. A lot of times it'll go to a locker plant or some sure. wild game processing plant. Typically they're going to know what to do and they will they will send it away with you, you know, in a professional manner. Um, so anyway, then we've got the deer and first thing we almost always do is check it over for damage. Yes. That's one thing. You don't want to get blamed for something that can go wrong. Um, there's a lot. Uh, anytime you're working with a deer cape, um, it's an organic, you know, skin that can start deteriorating the minute, you know, the heart quit pumping. So um, we've talked about this before. Um, bacteria starts growing immediately and bacteria is caused by moisture grows because of moisture and warm temperature and warm temperature doesn't have to be 70 degrees no. 50 degrees can be plenty warm 40 degrees can be plenty warm um, the cooler it is the longer time you have um, the moisture um, is just the moisture in the body is enough 
cause bacteria to start growing. Um, deer, for instance, typically, and, and that process is called slipping, where you can actually pull the hair with your fingers and pull it out. Um, once that process starts, it accelerates, it kind of snowballs. Deer are not, we call them slippers. Deer typically do not slip easy, they're not slippers. Um, with reasonable temperatures, I would say 30 to 40, 45 degrees, you've got a few days before you're gonna start seeing um, any kind of you know, downside to the right. temperature. But uh, do check that because when the animal comes in, we'll pull on the hair a little bit, make sure it's good. If anything puts up a red flag for you, if there's an odor, um, mm -hmm. deer, cape smell like deer. Antelope smell like antelope, bear smell like bear. Yep. If you're in the taxidermy business, it's not, it's, they don't stink, they smell like that species. Um, a deer that is starting to deteriorate will start to have an offensive odor. Yes. Bears that deteriorate will have an offensive odor. So if, you're, if you detect that, that, oh, something doesn't smell very fresh, check it right away. And I'm gonna show you how to do this invoice in a second. Um, check it right away when it comes in. Tell the customer, because when you write up his invoice, you're gonna write it on there so that you don't, yep. you know, he doesn't blame you for something going wrong. Another mm -hmm. thing, um, he might, you just had a deer you talked about the other day that we have that has two slug holes through the neck, yep. Um, yep. in and out. In and out, um, both sides. Here we have to use shotgun slugs, and they're big and they make big holes. And so, um, you know how big a 12 gauge is, that's how big the slug is in diameter. And when it goes in, it makes a very large hole yeah. and it cuts a lot, of hair. a lot of hair. When it comes out, it makes even a larger hole. Those have to be either fixed or the cape gets replaced. So check that sort of thing. Um, broadheads are terrible for the tax service. A broadhead <laughs> going are. in, although, I mean, how bad can it be? Some of those little blades are only, you know, half inch apart or across when it goes in, though it went in right here, all that hair starts way up there. So it cut all that hair. Yeah. So sometimes the repair has to be about this big and sometimes it can't be made and still keep the deer with the size neck that, it, that you yeah. want and that sort of thing. So check that. A um, lot of times people will cut them too short. That's why we like to have the mm -hmm. whole cape attached um, to the head and we will cut it off where we cut it, where we want it cut off so that we don't um, short ourselves on cape. Um, all kinds of things that can, you know, they might have growth, they might have antler gouges, there's a lot of different things. Try to look them over really, really good while the customer's there. Um, Question for me? Oh. Uh, Craig would like to know if you have any tips for hunters out there on field dressing and skinning to make the taxidermist job easier. Lots of lockers, <laughs> not taking whole deer. People try, but seeing too many fails. I think the best thing to do, there's a lot of good YouTube videos out there, yeah. things like that. Before, before you're confronted with having to do it, before, this, you, know, before you go out, um, spend a few minutes just glancing at them so in your mind you know yeah. you know what to do. Yeah, I think that, that would help tremendously. Just um, making sure that if, if you, Craig, you, you taxidermists out there, um, it wouldn't hurt you guys to make a video. Um, next time yeah. you get a deer in, make a video that shows the, your customers that you can refer your customers back to exactly what you want to have. Everybody wants to see them a little bit different, but um, that would be the best way to guarantee that you're gonna get what you want from it. But um, yeah, I think there's some really good diagrams too. Um, if you Google diagrams, I think there's, there are some that show, you know, an incision mm -hmm. up the back of the leg and they'll show a wrong cut, which would come up here across the armpit, across the chest and also conversely show a better cut that would come back behind the, the chest so you include all the armpit and leg. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a real good point and there are a lot of customers, more and more lockers are not taking deer 
a lot of states are not allowing you to cross state lines without the deer being taped because of CWD. Minnesota is one of those. You can't bring a deer out of, say, uh, Colorado into Minnesota unless it's been taped. So, um, yeah, I think it's the obligation of the hunter to kind of do his research on the front end and the taxidermist to point him in the right direction. So. Um, we were talking about uh, advertising and the one thing we did when we first built this building and we had a nice building and we, um, we've trashed it since then, <laughs> but <have> a nice <laughs> building. Um, had a nice, nice new building and we put on an open house on a Saturday oh, yeah, yeah, and we had, um, with, with combined with Southern Archery, we had, uh, um, what's the old, um, did uh, turkey calling and elk calling oh, yeah. and uh, we- Quaker boy. Yeah, and uh, we had, they came up and did seminars on, on different game calling, and we showed, um, we didn't do the actual caping of the deer, but we went over the whole thing, showed them, you know, on a screen right. how, to, how to cape, where to, where to cut it, That's do's and idea. don'ts, and, it, and we had a little lunch for them, you know, and, and uh, free giveaways, you know, Southern Archer, mm -hmm. I mean, we gave away we gave away a gun, we gave away a bow, and it was all donated stuff. And uh, it went over exceptionally good. And by talking to those people who you maybe have never talked to before, and they're gonna ask you questions. It's not like, sure. you know, you won't be uncomfortable because you do know what you're talking about. Always helps in that situation. And we, uh, uh, it went over so good, and that kinda helps your business, and you, talk to your customers and they'll call you they'll say I got a deer and I was at your open house and I saw where you did this and would it be okay if, you know they're gonna yeah. be very comfortable calling you and you're gonna recognize them when they come in uh, worked real well yeah. and for you guys that that's a great point for you guys that may be working out of your garage or a smaller a smaller shop setting um, partnering with Southern Archery, Southern Archery or yeah. or in uh, retailer in your area that might have a little better space or even restaurants or places like that. Some of the resorts this time of year are, are slowing down in the North Country. Um, maybe partner with them to get that venue. Sure. If, you, if you don't have the shop to put them in, that doesn't mean that you can't have an open house. Um, you know, you can kind yep. of think, think in those terms too. That might be a real nice way. We even, we even when I was running bear hunts in mm -hmm. Manitoba or in Ontario, we uh, went down to Arrowwood. It's Arrowwood oh, now. Resort, yeah. I think it was uh, maybe Village East or something like that later. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it was a Holiday Inn. We went down there and I bought hors d'oeuvres, put an ad in the paper, bear hunters wanted, um, bought hors d'oeuvres for these people and yeah. we had like 30 people come and yeah. showed slides of bear hunting how to take care of your bears, things like that. It was huge. That's fantastic. It was yeah. huge. That really, yeah. that personal connection with people is, even in today's age of computers and social media, that personal connection, I think, gets you. And like you said, of, you might not have a place to have an open house. Um, I was doing it out of my basement. So yeah. it wasn't like I can have 30 people down in my basement <laughs> and yep. have my wife make hors d'oeuvres <laughs> for them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about invoices. Um, you will all be licensed with the state and the federal government, and with that license comes the criteria they have to maintain. You're gonna have to have a tag with everything. You're gonna have to have, every, every uh, um, bird has to be tagged, as well as you have to maintain a book. Um, our system is, we have tags like these, and you do not need a tag like this, but you do need the information on it. Um, when I first started out, nobody had tags like this. And when you see official um, federal wa waterfall tags, there's nothing official about them. Um, I don't think the federal government puts out any kind of an official tag. They do have the right information on the tag and somebody makes those and sells those. Um, ours has all the same thing. This is called, I think it's called tieback. You can't break this stuff, you can't, you can't tear it. And, but it's got, some states require the license number. 
if they require the license number, there's a, a line up here for the license number. What state it is, government wants to know, the, the federal government and state wants to know when you shot it, when the customer got it, his name, address, telephone number I don't think they ask for, but we have a line here for your purposes, species, what it is, number of is important. They want to know if it's a bag of wood ducks. Is there one or ten in there? Mm -hmm. The date it was killed, DOK is a very important thing. And some states ask for it, some don't. The hunter's signature. Fill that out completely. A lot of times we'll have the customer fill it out himself. Make sure that a gel pen does not, it'll write on here just fine, but a gel pen, if it goes through pickles or in the freezer, things like that, a gel pen does not work very good. We usually use a Sharpie. Yeah. Then we like to, I like to, on the back of it, write the person's name really big, and I will wrap that right around and put it on the horns, on the antlers, like this. Here's the guy's name. And all that information is on the inside, nice and safe. Yeah. I've often heard you tell students, and we do, we make practice of it in the shop, make sure that your customer do that in front of them. Have them watch you put that tag on there, and then you can always tell them that tag did not come off. And they, they see you put it on, so there's no question as to. Believe it or not, in the, typically, I mean, in the summertime, we'll get a fish in today. It's easy to tag. You tagged it. Um, but in the fall, when deer season starts, there's been days where we've had three people in the showroom with three deer in boxes or sacks or whatever. And the one thing I don't want to have happen is the guy get in his truck and leave and think, I didn't see him put my name on that. You know, he's yeah. going to wonder about that. Um, Forever. So anyway, we write the person's name on the tag, put it on like that. And that, that goes with them. When these deer are done, like up in here, here's that, that same tag right on the back. It's just pinned to the form. And so when we mount them, we do a lot of different things to make sure we don't mix stuff up. Um, when that deer is caped, his name gets written on the skull. With a, with a magic mark, with a Sharpie. So his name's on the skull. Also, he's got his harvest tag here. Yeah. Also, he has the tag we put on. Yeah. Now, sometimes they're going to want to save that, so we'll usually cut it off and save it, and it might get pinned right to the deer. Once, this, once the form is set up and antlers are on and, and you're ready to mount, we like to take a nice, neat ballpoint and write on the back of the backboard his name. After that, we'll take this stuff off, pin it, lay it on the table until he's done and pin it on there. Um, when you get work, I mean, there's a lot of people that do three, four deer a day. Um, when you do that many deer, it's really easy to say, I thought I mounted that guy. Oh, that's his name. You know, I mean, you, you can get confused when you get busy. So we do a lot to make sure that doesn't happen. So name on the skull, name on the horns. Um, okay, so you're going to fill out the tag like this. Big letters, right, his name on the back. And the reason I like to do that, not so much on deer, because we cape our deer out right away when they come in. We don't we don't take a deer to the freezer unless it's already frozen. If they're soft enough to skin, they get skinned right away. And that's a safeguard because if they're thawed, going into the freezer, they really don't freeze for many hours. Yeah. And during that time, you're losing mounting time because you can actually, it adds to your slippage problem. Yeah. Then you have to thaw it out again. And then you're going to have many hours while he thaws and that adds to your slippage yeah. count. Ears might be thawed for six hours before you can ever get the face off of it. And nose might be thawed for several hours. So. I did a, uh, I did a seminar for the, for the 
Iowa Sports Show in Des Moines one time, and I, it was a slideshow, and I had a silver fox, jet black face and real pretty, you know, black and white guard hairs. And I laid him in the snow, and he was froze like a rock, and I took a thermometer and put it in his ears, which were black, mm -hmm. black, black, black. Oh, Sun man. was shining. Um, his ears got pretty fast up to 45 to 50 degrees, and he was froze like a rock. Um, that type of thing, you know, you might have a beautiful fox with no ears, you know. Yeah. So um, there's different things that can warm or thaw quicker than others. So that's why we don't like to take a deer in, freeze him, thaw him, skin him. It's, if they're yeah. thawed, spend the time to do it. You'll get fast at it. Uh, it doesn't take very long to cape a deer. Once you get the cape off, then you can, you can freeze that if you want to because it'll thaw out much faster. So fill this out. Um, look through your um, laws that the state gives you and just double check that everything on these tags you have filled out. Uh, we've got a question from Fred. He says, here in Ohio, we have a call in the system. Did I keep the original or would it be better to copy it? A call in system for harvest tag? I bet. I bet. So um, we, have a, we have a call in here. Same thing here. That's what this is. Uh, uh, it goes with, you got it with your license, right? Yep. Yep. And, uh, and then you, you call in, and uh, then this goes on the antlers. Yep, and you have to record that number that they give you. On the phone. On the phone, on that tag. And we have had a game warden in the shop after the season that goes through those to make sure that we may have taken in a deer that, although it's legally tagged, hasn't been registered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'd make sure that you retain that tag for the customer. We had, we had, this was a, a interesting thing. I was at a function one time and some guy said, hey, I've got a deer for you in the truck that I want you to do a, he wanted us to do one of those um, dipped skulls, oh, you yeah. know, in a, in a pattern. And uh, he said, I got it out, you know, outside. You can take it with you when you go. Never thought a thing of it. And he had not called it in. It was perfectly legal. Um, the deer, he had a license, he, everything was good, didn't call it in, never thought a thing of it. Game warden came and said, oh, that one doesn't have a harvest tag, I'll have to check into that. And he did, and it cost $300, to, not to me, to the, to the guy. So that's, I think that's what, you, what he's talking about is, mm -hmm. we call it a harvest tag. But. Yeah, he did say yes. Uh, we have another question from Jocelyn. Uh, what if the customer bought a tanned hide to be mounted? Would they need to provide a license number, date of kill, et cetera, uh, fur bear like fox or coyote? So they bought it intending to mount it. Um, oh. I think that's um, going to depend upon the state. Yeah, that'd depend on the state. Yeah. I think so. Um, and I, I guess it's always safer to buy them with that information if they didn't come with that information i think i would put down all of the information for the place that they bought it from from the fur buyer because that fur buyer should have a license and all of the information anytime too. i've bought um anything like that or dealings i've had with the dnr um, they keep referring to a paper trail mm -hmm. and they want a paper trail so so if, if it's legal for you in your state to buy antlers, you can buy antlers, but you better, to be safe, you better, the taxidermist should have whose they are, where they came from, day to kill, all that kind of stuff, everything that you see on here, and if they're legal to sell, you can buy it, but just so that they know that you bought it legally and that sort of thing. And uh, as far as fur bears, um, like when we sold fur to the students, we had a fur, fur dealer's license. So we could buy fur animals um, like uh, fox and coyotes and coons and we could resell them. But it takes a, a fur buyer's license to do that. But if they were buying just as an individual, 
they can buy from a fur buyer as an individual right, too, correct. and then just keep the information of the fur. And buyer. if you're wondering about any of that stuff, um, make a phone call. Call absolutely. the DNR. Yeah. They'll they'll tell you absolutely yes or absolutely no, and you don't have to worry about them neither, coming in. And neither do we. Don't tell them Tom and <laughs> Brett told you to do something. <laughs> Always call the DNR first. They're, make sure, and that's you know what I think that's a really good um, opening day comment to um, make an effort as a taxidermist to befriend your game wardens. Those guys are out there working for you um, to make sure that you're able to have a business that we still have deer around here next year for these people to hunt. Um, they can be a tremendous resource for you. If you ever get in a pickle or get in a situation where you have a, a customer situation that doesn't feel comfortable to you, don't be afraid to lean on your game warden either because that's a, if you make an ally out of him versus a you know, potential enemy out of the game warden, I think your life could be a whole bunch easier. Way money ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so then once a customer, you've, you've checked over his deer and things like that, then um, you're going to write up an invoice for him. And um, we have invoice books, but you can, you can make your own. Um, this has all the information that was on that tag. It's got his name. It's got his um, license number. It's got um, date of kill, species, what it is, all that information. Mount description. And if he wants a base, like say it was a, a pedestal mount or something like that, um, you can describe that in here. It's got a little spot for a sketch down here. And then in the pricing box, remember, it's always make sure you get a deposit because you don't mm -hmm. want to get stuck, especially this day and age. Um, the economy can be up one day and down the next. So somebody that brought you in a deer that uh, um, plans to have it mounted, if you have no money down, mount it, what if he doesn't come to pick it up? And I guarantee you from experience, you will never get stuck with a 170 inch whitetail, never. Nope. They'll always pick <laughs> it up. The ones you'll get stuck with are the little 110s, you yeah. know, or less. That have uh, no value. <laughs> and you're gonna do the best job ever and you gotta make a house payment and you call him and send him a card and he never shows. Um, so a deposit covers you for um, your tanning, your form, all of that site, all that sort of thing. I think um, standard deposit for deer, for instance, is about 50%. So say you charge um, $800 for a deer, get $400 down, that paid for the tanning, it paid for the form, and it paid for you to mount it. And when he comes to pick it up, um, everything's been paid for. Yeah. So get a deposit, a record it down here. Um, we have had instances where um, I always, I have a spot down here where it says check credit card or cash. Uh, make sure you mark that type of thing because I have people came in and said, oh, I think I gave you $200 bills, didn't I? Mm, we don't have that down, you know, so make sure you have that sort of thing. Um, and then signature, and like you mentioned, contract, this is, because we have had to take people to small claims court before, this is a legal contract. He agrees to everything. He agrees to that's who he is, his address, all that sort of thing, license number, he, when he got it, all that sort of thing. Um, amount description, he agreed that the cost was $800, he paid you four, he signs it down here, it's a contract. It works. So that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna fill out a, um, an invoice, invoice like that. And then for the state, now that's just for your bookkeeping. Yep. For the state in Iowa, we have to have every specimen tagged like this. We have to have a book that has all of this information in addition. We have, as a matter of fact, that's, one of, that's our giveaway today but you don't get it yet. Um, our giveaway is, I think, 100 tags and a book that has all of this information, which is legal, and I'm going to bet that it's probably legal for your state, too, because most states are, are getting very uniform in what you need to keep for the, for the DNR. 
Don't get lax in this. Um, sometimes we'll get busy and you might get behind and um, fishing game a lot of times, you know, they're not gonna jump on you if you didn't get a couple things that came in yesterday. But if you're not filling it out or if you're skipping pages with specimens, things like that, you will get in trouble. And uh, we had a uh, person call up one time and say, the game wardens came, I wasn't home and they took everything out of my freezer. And I, I said, was everything in your freezer tagged and in order? Yeah, pretty much. You know, <laughs> and um, the person was a poacher by reputation, and I think that's that's yeah. how they get in trouble. So make sure that everything's tagged. Very, very, very important in this business. Make sure that everything's in your book, and you won't have any problem with the fishing game. Um, one thing that we like to do is we'll actually fill out two tags for our deer. And that helps us because we can put one on the antler, it stays with the antlers, goes down the antler room, gets locked up away, and it stays there. But we also have a tag that once those antlers are removed from the cape, now we have a tag that we can put on the cape as well, and it will stay with that. So um, think about that too as you start breaking these things down as to being able to identify parts. And these will go, if you tan things yourself, these will go through the tan. They'll come out just fine. You won't hurt them there. You're not going to hurt these things. Um, if uh, you send them to the tannery, depending on which, depends on which tannery, but a lot of times we have our cape come back with this still. We put them on with zip ties. Yes. But uh, we'll make a little hole off of the form, just a little hole, slide a zip tie through and through here, um, and we'll get them back with these still attached. Yep, zip ties are preferred over wire ties. They don't seem to like the metal ties in their pickles and so forth, and uh, probably for shaving and so forth. But and I've even been impressed how they flesh around the hole mm -hmm. and flesh around yeah. the, the zip <laughs> yeah. tie. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah. I don't think I'd do that. I'd cut yeah, it off and, it and flesh. <laughs> um, so then, once um, we better talk about two, it's time to cape the deer. What's the first yeah. thing you're going to do? Um, we're going to take some measurements before we get our knife out. That's Why are you going to take measurements when you just buy a form? Well, we, if we buy a good one, we, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we need to take those measurements to make sure we can buy the right form, and that helps so much. I think, I think the more you pay attention to your measurements, the carcass, uh, who was, whose words of wisdom were put back what you take out? Um, is that Jim? Jim Kimball. Jim Kimball. Jim Kimball always says, always put back what you take out. Um, yep. Frank Neumeyer is in a seminar one time, and he said, um, he was talking about bird cheeks, and oh, yeah. these bird cheeks are all fluffed up, and he said, don't stuff a bunch of cotton in your bird cheeks. He said, I've skinned a lot of birds, and I have never found <laughs> cotton in my bird cheeks. He said, if you ever find cotton, call me any time of the day or night. You know, that was a <laughs> yeah. Frank Neumeyer seminar. Yeah. Um, go ahead and use that and, and show them what you do there. Um, well, we would like, assuming that this is the real animal, hide, hide horns, everything's still attached, we'd like to know a few things so that when we go to order the mannequin, we can get this as close to the actual deer that you had as possible. And as we spend more time studying deer, we found out that deer come in all shapes and sizes. And big deer can have a little face or big deer can have a big face. Um, big antlers don't always translate to big bodies. They don't always translate to big necks. So um, the most common one that we take, it, and the first one that you really need to take off of the carcass, is the front corner of the eye to the end of the nose. And that's pretty standard. I think you'll find it in every catalog. Um, we list it probably as our A measurement. That's kind of that's kind of all the the supply companies ask for yep. as far as the head kind of. Yep, and that's the first one. And you can take that, um, you can stretch a tape from the front corner. Um, you'll feel, you can feel that um, the front of the uh, orbital bone right here to the very end of the nose. 
Um, and I'm getting, by taking it this way, I'm just a hair short of seven and a half. I know this is a seven and a half inch head. So usually when you take it this way, you're gonna be just a little bit shorter. If we took it with calipers, um, like this guy, um, oops, this guy's not gonna go, there it goes. I need to do it so that, like that, and tighten it down again. Those are fancy. They are fancy, they'd give us a number here, but that's too many buttons to press. But then you can take your calipers there and lay it against your, against your form here. I'm, I'm about seven and three eighths, strong seven and three eighths, almost seven and a half. So we would wanna make sure and record that as the first measurement. Um, you can also take neck measurements off of the carcass if, if they included any of that, which um, a real handy one is to come right up under um, knowing that we've lost a little bit of blood pressure, um, the meat itself is deflated, um, and depending upon where the cut was, but if you have that carcass, it's nice to take that measurement just as an extra. This is going to show us 20 inches, and that's right at the narrowest part of the neck. And um, our catalog would also ask you to take the next one down, which is about two inches over the atlas bone, which is one of the largest measurements you'll get there. And a lot of times we see about a two inch graduation. So that's gonna be about a 20 by 22. But take those two measurements for sure. But then there might be a couple others that they wanna take. Do you wanna show them a few of those extra ones? That well, we'll make a... For instance, when you were under the weather last week, we had a, <laughs> a deer in. So and nice. and I looked at him and I thought, man, what a big head. That's a big head. I mean, mm -hmm. his muzzle was huge, so huge that I know that any How of our- How huge was it? It's so huge. <laughs> and I thought, I thought it's an Angus. Um, it was so big that I thought nothing that we have, it's gonna swim in there. Sure. So I, uh, took and you can draw your own you can draw your own little sketches but this is something that if I had nothing and I take that tan cape slide it over a, my dear mannequin I intend to use and I have all this loose skin here what am I going to do I'm going to start stuffing clay where it probably <laughs> shouldn't be and make cheeks, a mess right? of this thing um, so I took one of one of these measurement sheets and there's a lot of width in the noses, and I started measuring, um, you know, the wings on the top of the nose and the width of the pads on the side and the side of the mouth. So I just kind of filled out one of these sheets, and I thought that nose is so big that that's got to be a eight and a half inch nose. I measured the tip of the nose to the front corner of the eye. And it was seven and one half inches. Oh wow! And I thought it can't be. And I measured again. It was seven and a half inches, but it's a huge, huge nose. Now, um, when uh, when I first started business, uh, McKinsey was just, just, just beginning. Had not a lot of deer. Um, Joe Combs is was the go-to sure. at the time, and Joe Combs, which I didn't realize were sculpted from southern deer. And so any deer that we got in here, which tend to have a little fuller faces, um, I would mount these deer and I wouldn't know what to do up there. So there we go with the clay. So sure. I learned early on to take some measurements of, of your deer. Yeah. But if you have something like that to fall back on, so what I did was filled this out as much as I thought I needed. Um, I went out in the office and I made a copy of it and I stapled it to customer's invoice. I took the other one and we have a notebook, our hide notebook, I just slid it in there with the customer's name on it. Sure. Um, that's gonna come in very handy when I go to mount that deer, especially in the space area. We even have spiral bound hooks with those in that 
sheet in it now. In for mammals and game heads. Yes. And you can yeah. use this. You can use these for um, sheep, antelope, you know, goats, moose, whatever you yeah. want to. Um, they might not look like a moose, but it's still going to have the same measurements and show you where to yeah. take those measurements. Very handy. You can't, you can't make this look like what it was without knowing how wide or how deep it was yeah. and, and uh, different things like that. If you, another important one that we like yeah. a lot is, I think it's our E measurement, yeah. if you look at our catalog, is the orbital bone right at the caruncle. And that's a very important one because, because if, if the mannequin you get is much wider, that means you have to stretch that skin much harder. And that means that this eye is going to be more difficult to shape because yeah. you stretch that skin. Anytime you have to stretch skin while you're sleeping nice and sound <laughs> at night, that skin is stretching back. Yeah. And you're going to two days later happen to look at it and all of a sudden he's going to look like Yep, this like a little toddler so, and if you can if you can take a few measurements and um, it takes nothing to to shave this down or build it up if necessary but uh, with measurements between the eyes is is kind of a important thing for us too. Um, so much so that we have we have three different seven and a half inch heads with incrementally larger e measurements they're they're the same eye to nose length but they go on our bigger, I think this is a 20 by 22 neck, and I think this is, um, this is our 045 head that's on there. And we even have an 047, which is a seven and a half that's a little bit wider. So if you're, if you're finding that you're s consistently getting a wider measurement to your um, front corners of your eyes, um, you can order appropriate change out heads to, to match. Make it, sure that you're getting the right sizes. And uh, don't be nervous to do that. Um, it's very, very easy. And oh, to yeah. take one of these, we'll usually cut a little arc back here, cut our form off, and and yeah. uh, tack it on with some long um, torque head screws and look at it a little bit to make sure you don't have it slid way down forward or back too far. Make sure it conforms to the curvature of your neck and everything. Um, tack it on with a little bit of foam and you, you can wrap duct tape around it or all kinds of different things. Foam it on and a lot of times when we add or take, add a head, change a head, we'll put a little rod down through, you know, just a little ready rod. But it's very easy for us to change out a head, I would say is a 12 minute job anymore. It's very, very fast, very yeah, easy to do really and you can do it without messing them up. Yeah, and I think, I honestly think our our whitetail work, our game head work, has improved since then. Since we're putting the appropriate mannequin, taking more time with measurements and and changing out heads, um, they just mount so much easier than trying to stuff the cheeks full of cotton or <laughs> you know stretch to get tear ducts to fit. Um, it just when you put when you put back what you took out, it, taxidermy is much much easier. So we probably better let these people get back to skinning <laughs> some deer. Um, some of them probably had to stop just to listen to us. Now they can pause us. Um, do you want to pick a winner? Yeah, we did pick a winner. It is Randy Shanklin. Randy, um, I hope you enjoy this. Um, it's going to keep you out of jail. Yeah, we this hope is, so. <laughs> um, we've had many, many, many comments where where customers have said, you know, my game warden came by, um, wanted to see, they'll always want to see your, your record book. They want to see your record book and they might want to go through your freezer, that sort of thing. Um, if everything's filled out, you got nothing to worry about. Um, if you say, yeah, pretty much, maybe you do have something to worry about. Yeah. But uh, m the comment that we get all the time is that's the best record keeping system any of them yeah. have ever looked at when they check, check yeah. the taxidermist. So fill this out. Um, if you have any questions, call, call the DNR. They're more than happy to be helpful to you. Befriend your game warden, like you said. Um, make sure that you tag everything. Make sure you measure everything. Um, once you take that skin off of the carcass, all measurements that you could have got are not available anymore. 
Um, so that's really, really important. And check them over real good when the customer brings them in. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. All right. I wish everybody a happy fall and prosperous hunting season. It's getting started. See you next.